welcome as we gather to lift our praises to God. I'm Elizabeth Gilbert, pastor here at Union Chapel Indy. Thank you for choosing to worship in this time. Uh, in this way, we are so glad to gather with you. Today we begin a worship series titled Grace Wins. Over these next weeks, we'll spend some time in worship exploring the, the tremendous love that God just pours out on us, unmerited, unearned, undeserved, and yet so generous. In the church, we call this kind of love grace. So again, in the coming weeks, we'll explore these uh, ideas of grace, and we will give God thanks for the many ways he blesses and loves us. If you are with us for the first time, thank you for being a part of worship today. Please let us know if you have any questions, contact us through the church office. And again, thank you for worshiping with us. As we are together in this time, in this way, may we know God's power and presence. Welcome. The long arm of the Lord reaches out to you and bids you welcome to this time of worship. We are thankful for the shelter of God's love, which is always ours. The loving heart of the Lord is open to each and all. We open our hearts to receive God's love. Let us lift our voices in praise and thanksgiving. As we are loved, so let us love. Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of the Savior The hope of nations Savior, He can move the in the New Testament, a story of the Holy Spirit working through the first followers of Jesus to the birth of the Christian movement. 
This part of the story is reencounting Paul's experience in Philippi and that of a woman named Lydia as she hears about Jesus for the first time. Listen for Lydia's response to the gospel message of love and grace. Reading Acts chapter 16 verses 11 through 15. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. The following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which was the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained at the city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. There's a wall between guilt and grace I'm defining for the sacred space But I'm living proof Grace wins every time No more lying down in death's defeat Now I'm rising up in victory Singing hallelujah Grace wins If you are currently in a relationship or have been in one in the past, you may remember that time prior to what we might call the committed phase of the relationship, that time before you were going steady or in a relationship or even engaged or married. What do you remember about that time before? Were you trying to impress the other person? Putting your best self out there? You were laughing at all their jokes and witty comments. You were listening intently to every word and story. I suspect you were giving the other person your best attention and the best version of yourself that you could. One generation might have called that time courting. Another generation might have called that wooing. Another calls it dating. Whatever it's called, it's that time before of pursuing with the sweetest and gentlest of words and actions. Prior to nearly every significant commitment, whether that be marriage, job, a move, just adulthood, whatever it is, there is the before. And before jumping into whatever it is with both feet, we like to just sort of dip our toes in, don't we? We want to test the waters, get the lay of the land. We want to preview whatever we can, whether that be the job description, the new neighborhood, the new school system. Not only does the before give us helpful information, if the before reveals the possibility of a desirable and attractive next step, it serves to entice us, to draw us toward that next thing. If you are a follower of Jesus, do you remember the before of that relationship? In the story we read this morning from the book of Acts, we learn about one woman's before. Her name is Lydia. And the story itself gives us some clues about who she is. Paul says, We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We might hear the subtext under this travel log, Dorothy proclaiming, Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Paul's recalling of all the places they were traveling through is to assure his readers that they're not in Jewish Palestine any longer. 
They are a long way from home. They are, in fact, nowhere near Jewish people or Jewish culture. You can see here on this map, the places mentioned in this passage are in the upper left part of this map. Troas is the starting point Paul references, and that's in the pink, just under the large word Thrace. And then follow the red line west. Samothrace, Pastasos, to Neapolis, and then to Philippi. You can see how far they are from Jerusalem, the center of Jewish life, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of the map. It is better than a 6,000-mile journey. Then to emphasize just how far they are from Jewish life, Paul adds this. On the Sabbath day, that's the Jewish holy day of the week, like Christian Sunday, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. Even this comment tells us something about who Lydia was. This tells us there's no Jewish synagogue in town. A Jewish synagogue only required 10 Jewish men. So just 10 men. It's obvious we're not in that community. So Paul sat down with some women who had gathered. These weren't even Jewish women. Paul calls Lydia a worshiper of God. That's kind of code for a, a Gentile, a non-Jew, who worshiped the Jewish God or professed the Jewish faith. So we have here a woman with only minimal exposure to the Jewish faith and culture, living geographically far from the hotbed of Jewish life. A woman who was uncharacteristically independent and wealthy, Lydia was a dealer in purple cloth, scripture says, the most expensive kind of cloth. And so she would do business with the rich and famous of her day. She apparently owned her own home. Lydia was a woman who had no need of any man, any religion, anything that anyone had to offer. She had on her own, her own wealth, independence, and access to influential people. But on this morning that we read about, she finds herself with this Jewish leader who also happened to be a follower of Jesus, and she begins to listen to what Paul has to say. And of course, Paul tells her about Jesus and the grace of Jesus, the mercy, love, compassion, and salvation of Jesus that is available to her. And the story ends with her and her household being baptized, her and her household becoming followers of Jesus. Lydia before, she had no knowledge of Jesus, no interaction with followers of Jesus. Lydia after, she's fallen in love with the one who loves her. Lydia herself becomes a follower of Jesus. And according to this story, the only difference between her before and her after is this one sentence. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. The Lord opened her heart. The Lord drew her to the Lord's self for one simple reason. Because God loved her and wanted her near. Even her, a non-Jew, she's not of God's chosen people. She's female, insignificant in the social order. But to God... She was just as you and I are, precious, beloved, wonderfully made, a masterpiece, God's own child. Before Paul arrived in Philippi, before Lydia found herself in that conversation with Paul, before the events of this day, God had prepared a way for Lydia to come to God through trust in Jesus. This, this gift of access to God, the gift of relationship with God through Jesus is what we call grace. Grace, as we United Methodists define it, is the love and mercy given to us by God because God wants us to have it, not because of anything we can do to earn it. We read in the letter to the Ephesians, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. 
Our entire Methodist heritage is rooted in a deep and profound understanding of God's grace, God's unmerited love freely given to each and all. This incredible gift of grace, a theme that will carry us through several weeks of worship, flows from God's great love for us. In John 3.16, we find this key thought of the New Testament and the Christian faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. This amazing, unfathomable, unmerited love that God pours out on us, what we call grace, was understood by John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, as having um, different and progressive phases, if you will. In Wesley's simplest outline, he identified God's grace as active and working in our lives in these three ways. Begins with prevenient grace, moves on to justifying grace, and finally through to sanctifying grace. Justifying grace we'll talk about next week. It is that gift and work of God that brings us into right relationship with God. Sanctifying grace is for the following week. It is the ongoing work of God in our lives that shape and mold us in Christ-likeness. But this week, prevenient grace. Prevenient, an old word John Wesley used. Uh, my spell check never likes it. But Wesley's other favorite word for this season of grace was preventing, similar to prevenient, preventing grace, a word uh, he used in the 1700s very differently than the way we use it today. But the words prevenient and preventing both come from a Latin root word that means to precede, to go before. Prevenient or preventing grace then is simply the grace that goes before. Before what? before any understanding we might come to have of who Jesus is, who Jesus is for us, and before our entering into a relationship with him. Prevenient grace is that grace at work before we even know it to prepare us for that relationship. It's like that time before commitment or marriage that we talked about earlier, that time of wooing, of, of drawing, of pursuing. It's like when we enjoy a good meal at a nice restaurant. We just don't show up and the meal magically appears. All kinds of things go before, precede our experience of the meal. Clear back to when food is grown and harvested, processed and shipped, purchased and delivered, cleaned and cooked, a place is built to house the restaurant, on and on and on. All the things that precedes our experience of having that food placed in front of us and us enjoying the meal. If intentionally entering into a relationship with God through Jesus is the meal that's placed before us at a restaurant, prevenient grace is everything God does prior to that to woo us and to pursue us with love and mercy and to prepare us to know God and live that life with God. It's things like placing loving people in our lives, like showering us with blessings, things like giving us a sense of wonder at a beautiful sunset or the majesty of mountains. Maybe it's making us curious about the church or the Bible or Christians. There are endless ways God pursues us, preparing us to meet God through God's son, Jesus. The Reverend Gary Henderson puts it this way. Prevenient grace is a really large term, but to keep it simple, it is grace before we knew we needed. Grace reaches out to us. It is God's provision for us before we knew it and before we were aware of it. I have this image of the circus and the trapeze artists, and they're doing these incredible things way up high, and it's dangerous. Life is like that. Sometimes they begin to fall, and there's a net there. Sometimes as people, we begin to fall. And through prevenience, we have a 
net available to us. Grace is everywhere. We are caught up in the net of God's care. John Wesley understood this grace. It is this grace that was so compelling for John Wesley that he shared with the whole world and it reaches out even to us today. Want to learn more about United Methodist Beliefs? Visit umc.org beliefs. To find a pastor to talk to and a church to visit, try Find a Church at umc.org FAC. Growing up, there was one house in particular that I remember across the street from the house I grew up in. The owners of that house I knew simply my whole growing up years as Mr. and Mrs. Julerette. And by my young discernment, they were about as old as people could get. Uh, but they became very dear to me and my family. Now we lived in an older neighborhood in a small town and their house, so typical of the time, had one of those deep front porches that went clear across the house. And on this porch, Mr. and Mrs. Julerette had about a dozen comfy uh, chairs and rockers. On any given Sunday evening, that was where all the adults in the neighborhood congregated. Kids would come and go. We all knew that's where our parents would be. If of an evening I couldn't find my mom, I was pretty sure she was at the Jewelerettes and I would just hop across the street to find her there. The grown-ups were not there to make uh, deep decisions, to have profound conversations, to change the world in any significant way. They were not there to even spend a great deal of time, although sometimes they did. They were there just to be neighbors, to chat, to relax, to get to know one another, to care for one another in a, a uniquely gentle, loving, neighborly way. John Wesley used the metaphor of a house to describe our spiritual journeys. Our justification by faith he calls the door. Our passing through the door into the house is our experience of entering into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. The interior of the house then is the ongoing life with Christ where we grow and mature in faith. But prevenient grace that we're talking about today, the grace that goes before and prepares us for that full experience of Christ, is the grace of the front porch. It's on that front porch of faith that God prepares our hearts and our minds to hear and receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and to respond in faith. It's that front porch grace that pursues us in ways that are gentle and kind and loving. It's where Jesus invites us to come on up, sit a while, make yourself comfortable, let's chat. If you know Jesus, who was it that sat on the porch with you? shared their stories, listened to yours, showed you God's kindness, God's love, so that you might be ready to hear and respond to Christ's voice yourself. Is there someone you want to thank this week for being God's grace to you even before you knew who God was? Maybe that's your task this week, to, to make a call, write a note, send a text, and say thank you to someone for the time they spent with you on the front porch. And if you know Jesus, you likely have some people in your life that you hope and pray and wish for them the same thing. You pray for them a relationship with Jesus that brings hope and peace and comfort and encouragement like you've known. And while I don't know the mind of God and don't profess to understand the ways of Jesus, I am confident of at least one thing. God wants that relationship with that person even more than you want it for them. And God has already prepared to welcome and receive them. God is already loving him or her with God's incredible, selfless, unconditional love. 
God is already pursuing them with kindness and tenderness. God is already doing everything God can do to woo them through the loving people around them, including you. Continue to let your life, your words, your actions, your attitudes, be that which entices and attracts them, that whets their appetite for more, that introduces them to Jesus-like love and relationship. Hang out on that porch where the world is waiting and watching. And let them see God's welcome, God's love, God's grace previewed in you. This idea of the front porch as the place where God begins His work in people's lives is where I found my strongest, most clear call to ministry and service. A poem I heard years and years ago has been hanging on my wall and has been reminding me, uh, encouraging me, of the importance of all that happens on the front porch. It's titled, I Stand by the Door. Just a few lines from that poem. I stand by the door. I neither go too far in nor stay too far out. The door is the most important door in the world. It is the door through which people walk when they find God. There is no use my going way inside and staying there, when so many are still outside and, and they as much as I crave to know where the door is. So I stand by the door. The most tremendous thing in the world is to find that door, the door to God. The most important thing that anyone can do is to take hold of one of those blind, groping hands and put it on the latch, the latch that only clicks and opens to each person's own touch. Nothing else matters compared to helping them find it and open it and walk in and find God. So I stand by the door. Whose hands am I intended to put on the latch? I shall stand by the door and wait for those who seek it. I had rather be a doorkeeper. So I stand by the door. It's a word of encouragement for those of us who have gone through the door of faith to remember and to continue to serve those still outside, those still searching, those who are hanging out on the porch. And if that's you, if you're still unsure about this whole Jesus thing, if you're not sure about who God is, what benefit it might bring you to know Jesus, that's okay. Let me assure you first that it's okay to be here, to be among this body of believers at Union Chapel, this church, and not be a believer. We love you. We are glad to welcome you and are honored to have you here, whether that's once in a while or all the time. Second, let us know if you have questions, if we can be helpful in any way, if there's anything we can do to bless or serve you. And when we get all wrapped up in church stuff, when we get too busy inside the house, remind us to just have a seat on the porch and chat. I invite you to consider uh, this place, this church, whatever time we have together, a front porch. I hope you'll consider it a safe place to hang out, a place to get to know a few Christians, a few of Jesus' followers, a place where you can ask questions, listen to stories, a place where you can tell your own stories. And if we can help you find the door to enter into a fuller relationship with Jesus, we'd be glad to do that. And if not, you are welcome here on the front porch for as long as you'd like to stay. You are loved, you are welcome, and you are wanted here. Grab a chair, sit a while, we'd love to get to know you. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray for all those, those on the front porch who are still outside. Maybe they're out at the street, not even sure they want to approach the porch yet. God, we know that's okay. Help us to love them well. 
We thank you for those who have found their place on the porch, who are asking questions, who are seeking. Use us to bless and, and honor their curiosity. Continue to draw us, each one, closer, nearer, more fully into your loving embrace. And as we sit on the porch, as we greet people, as we chat, as we get to know them, give us to be faithful in love and service. Encourage us in ways that will bless and care for all those people God puts in our paths. God, we pray that we might be a part of their before story. And as such, make our words always kind our actions always generous, our hearts always as yours, loving and open and welcoming. Amen. Remember back in March at the beginning of the public health crisis when people were putting a great deal of creativity and effort like our lives depended on it, into entertaining one another with good humor and lots of fun things to do. And we finally had the time on our hands to do all those things that we promised ourselves we'd do if only we had the time on our hands. Learn a new skill. Or a new language. Or go on a walk and watch the glory of nature in bloom. I'll bet you saw some really cool creative things come out of that first few weeks on the internet and from your friends. Our neighborhood organized a game of teddy bear bingo where all the neighbors hid a stuffed animal somewhere on their property so that the kids on a walk with their families could play a game. Some people really dug deep with their free time creating works of art or silly videos. I'll be there for you. joking to lighten the mood. Well, it's five months later, and apparently we still have a long road ahead of us. So your grace, your love, your kindness are no less important now. I challenge you this week to remember that your good attitude and your creativity are a gift from God, and that you might not be able to change the world for everyone, but this week you could change the world for someone. Write a letter to a friend. Share a good joke. Bake a pie for a neighbor. Loan someone a great book. You can't change the whole world like Jesus did, but you can change a moment into a happier one. And sometimes that's a really big thing. Grace wins! Galatians 6, 9 tells us, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Here at Union Chapel, we are working diligently toward that time when we can gather again for in-person worship. Please note that that will not be before September 1st. Not only do we want to make sure we can reopen safely in regard to all concerns related to COVID-19, we have lots of ongoing construction here on the property and wanna make sure that all those concerns are cared for and that we can move about safely in that regard as well. Stay tuned for details and more information. And in the meantime, please continue to worship with us online and engage us on all of our social media platforms. We worship on Sundays, 10, 15 a.m. You'll find those worship videos as you did today on YouTube or on our Facebook. Just search for Union Chapel Indy. And of course, as I said, join us online on our social media platform anytime. As you can see, there are a variety of ways you can continue your financial support of this ministry during this time of online only worship. If you have any questions about giving, please be in touch with the church office. We'll be glad to help in any way we can. There's also a link in the description of this worship on our YouTube page. We are so grateful to all those who are continuing your faithful giving and especially those who have set up recurring regular gifts to this ministry. Your faithfulness and commitment is a blessing to this ministry and to all those whom we serve. Because God gives, we give. Thank you for your generosity. 
Thank you for being a part of this worship during this time. And thank you to the tech team, our media team, musicians, all who contributed so that we could host worship today. If church and worship are new to you, we are especially grateful that you've joined us. Please let us know how we can be helpful. If you have questions, if there are things we can pray with you about, you can contact us through the church. All the information is at unionchapelindy.org. You know, it makes a difference in the world that you know Jesus. I invite you to go into your week to be his love in the world, trusting that God goes before you to prepare the way and be present in all that you experience. Go in Christ's peace to be his peace. Amen.